The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as I mentioned, he kept calling to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Quraysh, they gave up. They gave up. They did everything to the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. And now they reached that level there. We, we try to show him something, beautify something to him. Doesn't want it. We scared him. Doesn't want it. What should we do? So then they said, the only thing we really need to do is we need to وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد before I start, my beloved brothers and sisters, some of you may not have been uh, informed or not aware that there is uh, the class of Sheikh Muhammad Tim Humble who has started after Salatul Maghrib. Juz Tabarak. So please try to come and benefit from that uh, class. If you're in any situation where you can't come to one of them, then don't come to this one. That is more important. The tafsir of the Quran is what? More important. If you have to come to one, come to that one, inshallah ta'ala. And if you come to both, inshallah ta'ala, hopefully you will benefit. Bi-idhnillahi al-kareem. Inshallah ta'ala, last lesson we were talking about Islam Abi Dhar. Abi Dhar al-Ghifari, his Islam and how he embraced Islam and how he took Islam. We mentioned Abi Dar al Ghifari, his name is Jund ibn Junada. But that's not agreed upon by all of the ulama. Some of the scholars believe that his name is not Jund. That's his name. Some of the scholars believe that his name is not Jund. Okay, Jund ibn Junada. Jund ibn is not his name. So there are different views on that. And even his father's name, there is difference of opinion regarding that as well. So there are aqwal on both sides. Like in the Jumhur al-Ulama, the overwhelming majority of the scholars believe that his name is what? Jund ibn Junada. From them, Ibn Hajar, Ibn Abdul Barr, Ibn Athir, Nawawi. All of them believe that his name is Jund ibn Junada. Ibn Hajar mentions it in his kitab al-Isaba, fi tamiz al-Sahaba. Ibn Abdul Barr mentions it in his kitab al-Isti'ab. Ibn Athir, he mentions it in his kitab Usud al-Ghaba. And Nawawi mentions it in his sharh or his hadith collection, the 40 hadith. So we were talking about the Islam of Abi Dhar al-Ghifari. Abi Dhar al-Ghifari, he is from the tribe of al-Ghifar, as you can see. And his story of his Islam is a very fascinating story. Abi Dhar al-Ghifari, قبل al-Islam, before he embraced Islam, he came from a very hard lifestyle. He was a highway robber. Abi Dar al Ghifari. In other words, he used to block off roads and he would take money from people illegally. And he would even go to tribes and he would take their belongings and what they owned with force. And then he embraced Islam and his life changed, which really teaches us a lesson which is sometimes. We as Muslims see a person who embraces Islam from a very hard lifestyle. And then we think, no, nah, this is something that's not adding up here. This person, he's done all of these bad actions and he said all of these bad things and Islam is bigger than that. As we're going to see later, Abi Dhar al-Ghifari had a, a view in Islam. Look how his life changed from being a highway robber even when he told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he's, his name is called Abi Dhar and he's from the people of Ghifar, as we're going to see inshallah in the story, the Prophet put his hand on his head. In other words, Ghifar, first of all, his people were notorious. His people were notorious. They were يعني, known for causing mischief. And we're going to see that in the narration. Abi Dhar said when he told his tribe and who he, the people he's from, and the Prophet put his hand on his head. He said, Abu Dhar, 
I felt that the Prophet Sallallahu hoped I didn't mention my people. Because these people were known. But later Abi Dhar, when he embraced Islam and he became a noble companion, he was known for a fatwa. No one else held this opinion except him, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, which is he believed you're not allowed to store your wealth. In other words, you're not allowed to have savings. Abi Dhar held the opinion savings is not allowed. When you get money, you have to utilize it that day, that time, and nothing can be left over from your wealth. So whatever money that would be left over in his house, he would give it out to Abi Dhar al-Ghifari. It was a strange opinion that he held. He didn't just hold this opinion, rather he used to enforce it and impose it. And he used to scare the people who held another opinion other than his. And he used to say that you guys are probably going to fall under the people Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about who will be punished with their wealth the day of judgment. He said, this I may apply to you. Actually, he said, it will apply to you guys. Another position he took later in his life, Abidhar al-Ghifari radiallahu ta'ala anhu, was that he used to have a servant. And whenever he had a servant, whatever he got, because he didn't believe you can store anything. If he got two cloths, the top part, he would give it to his servant and he would wear the bottom one. He would share from the lifestyle he had Qabl al-Islam and the lifestyle that he got after Islam shows you, my beloved brothers and sisters, that when somebody takes Islam and the way that they were before Islam should not be said anything about once they embrace Islam. This is very important. Number two, Islam should change a person's life. As a person who embraces Islam, Islam should change your life. And even if you're a Muslim, when you start taking your deen serious and you learn about your religion, it should change your life. Now let's listen to Abi Dhar al-Ghifari's story. I find it one of the most remarkable stories as a, as a revert. Abi Dhar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. His story is narrated in many different places. But the one I'm going to mention, inshallah ta'ala, is that which Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal mentioned in his Musnad and Imam al Bukhari, Imam Muslim, sorry, Muslim ibn al Hajjaj ibn Muslim, and Naysaburi mentions in his Sahih. Abi Dhar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, Kharajna min qawmina. Another narration mentioned he and his mother and his brother Unais, three of them, they went somewhere. فَقَالَ أُنَيْسٌ His brother Unais, when they, they came somewhere. And then Unais said, when they reached their destination, Unais said, I need to leave you guys. He said, إِنَّ لِي حَاجَةً بِمَكَّةً I need to go to Mecca. I have something to do. So he said to his brother, Abi Dhar al-Ghifari, can you in the meantime look after mom? Look after our properties and everything. I'm going to go to Mecca and I'm going to come back. فَانْطَلَقَ Unais left. And when he left, فَرَاثَ عَلَيَّ ما معنى فَرَاثَ عَلَيَّ What does it mean? It means he delayed. Abi Dhar al-Ghifari, he delayed for a little bit. يعني he took, he took some time. أي أبطأ نووي says. He took a bit long time. So what happened was, and then after a long period of absence, he came back to me. So the Abu Dhar said to him, What imprisoned you? What made you come late? He said, Of course, I went to Mecca, so I met a man. He said, Okay, who what was this man saying? This man was claiming that Allah sent him on your religion. And what he meant by that was Abi Dhar al-Ghifari, before he met the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, and before he embraced Islam, three years prior to that, Abi Dhar used to pray. Abu Dhar didn't believe what his people believed. He was looking for a spiritual thing. So for three years he used to pray. The narrator asked him, for three years you were praying to who? He said, I was praying to Allah. Okay, he said, how? Well, where were you praying towards? He goes, wherever Allah directed me. I was facing. So he was looking for a spiritual thing. He was going on a, a quest of finding something. So that's why his brother said to him, 
he's calling to something similar to what you're doing. فَقُلْتُ أَيْدًا said, مَا يَقُولُ النَّاسُ لَهُ So then what are the people saying to him? He said the people, what, are, what, are, what they're saying to him is, إِنَّهُ شَاعِرٌ وَسَاحِرٌ وَكَاهِنٌ They are saying about him that he is a magician, that he is a poet, and that he's a, a soothsayer. That's what they're saying about him. Unais, who's the brother of Abi Dar al-Ghifari, was already a poet. So he said, I can eliminate whether he's a poet or not. I can eliminate that he's not a poet. I, I've listened to what he's saying. I know this man is not a what? He's not a poet. Case closed. And also, as for the speech of the Kuhan, the soothsayers, now I've heard their speech and the way that they talk. This man doesn't seem to be talking in that method and in that way. So I've also eliminated that. And from the way he carries himself, he doesn't seem to be a person who has a hidden agenda. So for according to me, Wallahi innahu la sadiq. Unay said, to me he seems like a truthful person. Wa innahum la kadhibun. And these people, what they are saying about him is a lie. So, so far the story is, Abi Dar al-Ghifari's brother Unais went to Mecca, returned back from Mecca, and is giving Abi Dar what he saw in Mecca and what he felt from the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. Abi Dar then said to him, you haven't really given me what I was looking for. I, f I feel like there's more to this. So can you do me a favor then? Let me go to Mecca. I will go to Mecca and I will see it for myself. What you're giving me is half-baked information. I prefer seeing it for myself. هَلْ أَنْتَ كَافِيَةً Are you going to suffice me or take care of mom and everything? حَتَّى أَنْطَلِقَ فَأَنْظُرَ So that I can go and look at it myself. قَالَ نَعَمْ أُنَيْ said yes, go. So he left Abi Dhar رضي الله عنه. But Unay said to him, before you leave, let me tell you something. فَكُنْ مِنْ أَهْلِ مَكَّةِ عَلَى حَذَرٍ Again, be careful. Be cautious. Okay, be careful. فَكُنْ مِنْ أَهْلِ مَكَّةَ عَلَى حَذَرٍ When you go to Mecca, be very cautious and diligent, and vigilant, and look around. Because they are against Nabi Muhammad and they are also against his followers. قَالَ أَبُوْ ذَرٍ أَبُوْ ذَرٍ said, I took my brother's advice on board and so I came to Mecca. He saw a man who seemed fragile and weak. So he thought this would be the best person to talk to. Because if you talk to somebody who seems strong and big, he thought he might be able to do something to him. So he saw a weak individual sitting somewhere. So he came up to this weak individual and he said to him, Aina هَذَا الرَّجُلُ where is this man? So first of all, he didn't mention it was the Prophet. If the man doesn't know it, he's going to be like, I don't know what you're talking about. And if he leaves it, General Abu Dhar was expecting to get out of it. And say, I don't know, I was talking about somebody else. He is scared. It's, the atmosphere is not good. So anyways, he said, when he asked that question, Abi Dhar, and he said to him, by the way, he used the word asabi. Asabi in the Arabic language is used for a man who apostates from the religion of his people. That's what it means. And he left and abandoned the religion of his people. So in other words, Nabila Muhammad, this is what he was known in Mecca. The one who abandoned the belief and the core tenets of his people. So Abi Dhar, when he asked the man this question, the man screamed. And he said to the people, Asabi, Asabi, he pointed at him. And so the people came running with rocks and stones and sticks. Abi Dar said, Famala ahlul wadi alayya bi kulli madaratin. The entire people of the valley, the, everyone who was sitting there came running at me and they hit me so badly until I fainted. I lost conscious. And then he regained consciousness. Abidar al-Ghifari woke up again. And when he woke up, 
he was bleeding. He said, I was bleeding so much that my face was covered with blood in my entire body. And then he said, فَأَتَيْتُ زَمْزَمَ I came to the water of Zamzam, put my hand in there and I washed my face and I washed myself with it. And then he said, فَشَرِبْتُ مِنْ مَائِهَا I drank the Zamzam water. وَغَسَلْتُ عَنِّ الدَّمَ And I cleaned from myself the blood. And then Abu Dhar mentioned something powerful. He said, وَلَقَدْ لَبِثْتُ ثَلَاثِيرًا بَيْنَ يَوْمٍ وَلَيْلًا I stayed for 30 days and 30 nights on only Zamzam water. That's all I drank. I had no other food. 30 days and 30 nights. I was drinking and I was eating. مَا كَانَ لِي طَعَامٌ إِلَّا مَا زمزم. I had no other sustenance except Zamzam water. He said, فَسَمِنْتُ The Zamzam water caused me to become chubby. I became fat from drinking Zamzam water. حَتَّى تَكَسَّرَتْ عُكْنَ بَطْنِي Until I gained flabs on my stomach just from drinking the Zamzam water. And later when he tells this to the Prophet that he drank the Zamzam water, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, إِنَّهَا مَاءٌ مُبَارَكًا The Zamzam water, it's a water which is blessed. The Prophet said, the Zamzam water is food. It's not just water. It's full of what? It's full of barakah. وَلِذَلِكَ The Messenger told us, عليه الصلاة والسلام, ما الزمزم لما شرب له. You get whatever you drink the zamzam water for. ولذلك الإمام حافظ بن حجر, he went to the Kaaba and he poured himself a cup of zamzam water and he drank it and he drank it with the intention of Allah making him like an Imam with Dhabi. حافظ بن حجر had a sip of the zamzam water. He said, Ya Rabbi, I want to know the narrators. The way that who? Al Imam al Dhabi. Al Imam al Dhabi knew it. So the scholars used to. So, so over the years, I collected from Butun al Kutub, from the books, whenever I come across it in the biography of the scholars, any scholar who drank Zamzam water for an intention under the heading Ma'u Zamzam Minima Shuri Bala, who then reached it in their life. These are benefits you can write. Are we all together, brothers? And there are so far 30 scholars that I have. So drinking Zamzam water is full of what? It's full of benefit. So he said, I drank it until I became chubby from drinking it. Qala radiyallahu anhu Abi Dhar then said, فَبَيْنَ أَهْلُ مَكَّةِ فِي لَيْلَةٍ قَمْرَى One night, it was the moon was out, it was a full moon. There was no one in the Makaaba. By the way, Abi Dhar, when he got beaten and he went to the Zamzam water, he went in hiding. For those 13 days and 13 nights, he was hiding. He didn't want anyone to see him. But then one night, he saw that everyone was sleeping. The Kaaba was empty. So he walked into the Kaaba. And he saw two women doing tawaf around the Kaaba. And they both were asking an uh, idol that they were worshipping, which is, which is called Isaf and Naila. Isaf and Naila were two idols in the Kaaba, which the scholars mentioned they were committing zina in the Kaaba, and so then Allah turned them into stones. And so the people of Mecca were worshipping them. Are we all together? As a side funny story, the scholars mentioned that there was a man once upon a time, when he was traveling, he had all of his belongings on his donkey. And as he was traveling, and he had all his belongings on his donkey, the donkey, over a period of time, and he became weak and fragile, so the donkey died. And the man was forced to take his own proper yeah, any belongings and stuff on his shoulders. And, but what he did was, out of respect for his donkey, because this donkey was a donkey that took care of him and carried his belongings, he buried it where he died. And he left. And he did this when he left the city. As soon as he left the city, the donkey died, so he buried the donkey where it was. And he left. A few years came, went by, the man came back to the village and he had found where he buried his donkey. A temple was built, a shrine, and the people were begging it. So he said to the people, what is this? Why are you guys here? What's this shrine? What's this? They said to him, because remember the city, people of the city, are, they woke up and they saw a grave. They think, well, where did this grave come from? So they said, angels came down and buried a righteous individual in this place. 
And so that's why the people, they ask their needs. And it's, the city was poverty, hunger, stricken. And, but they spent so much money on what? On building a shrine. He said to them, listen, man, my donkey was here. I buried my donkey here. Are you there, brothers? So it's similar to what happened to Kufaru Quraysh, which is Isaf and Naila. They were not two righteous people. These five individuals in Abbas told us that they were five righteous people. Come back to the story. Abi Dhar, when he saw these two women going around the Kaaba and they were asking Isaf and Naila, he went inside the Kaaba between the cloak of the Kaaba. He hid there because he's scared. He's scared of anybody. And then he saw two women. Now again, Abi Dhar hasn't embraced Islam, so there are still jahili traits in him. So when he saw these two women, again, that time the women used to do tawaf around the Kaaba naked. They used to believe that was a form to get closer to Allah by it. And the reason why they used to take their clothes off was because they would say, we've committed sins and haram on our clothes. We want to go and face Allah with what? Obedience with us, like their flesh and their mouth and all of that hasn't committed sins as well. Ala kullin, Abi Dhar, when he hid there, he saw both of them going around the Kaaba seven times. What he wanted to do was he wanted to take them out of the Kaaba, get rid of them, because he thought if they are in the Kaaba, Nabi Muhammad may not come into the Kaaba. So what he did was he stood, and when the first woman came by, he said a vulgar speech to her, which is not, it's not sensible to mention it here. Very vulgar, but indirect. So she, she ignored him and she went around the Kaaba a second time. Now he spoke it clearly and categorically, he said a vulgar speech to her. Then the woman, both of them screamed and cried from what Abu Dhar al-Ghifari said to them. And they ran. As they were running out, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Abu Bakr Siddiq Radiallahu Ta'ala Anhu was coming down from a hill, both of them. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw these women and said, what is the problem? By now that they're covered and they're dressed because they've come out. So the Prophet said, what's the issue? What's happened? They said, there is a sabit I mean the guy, a sabit was Abi Dhar, the one that was beaten the other day. He's hiding behind a in the Kaaba and he has spoken these words so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said to them Ma qala lakuma. what did he say to you that man they said to him this I want you guys to underline this point and he took me by surprise they said qala lana kalimatan tamla'ul fama qala lana kalimatan tamla'ul fama they said, he said to us words that our mouths cannot say. These are women who are not Muslims. Are we all together, brothers? They don't, they're trying to avoid speaking vulgar. So they say, we can't say these words that he said. So the Prophet ﷺ, he came, and Abu Bakr, and both of them, they did their tawaf, and they prayed, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Abi Dhar. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam finished praying, Abi Dhar Al-Ghifari, another benefit, sometimes people might ask you, Abi Dhar was the first person to ever say, Assalamu Alaikum. He was a what? He was actually the first person to ever say to the Prophet Alaihi Wasallam, Assalamu Alaikum. So he said it to him. He said, Assalamu Alaika Ya Rasulullah. And the Messenger then said to him, Wa Alaika Assalam. Rahmatullah. Then the Messenger said to him, anta? Who are you? He said to him, Ana min ghifar. I'm a man from the people of Ghifar. Fa'ahwa biyadihi, the Prophet took his hand. Fawada'aha ala jabhati, the Prophet put his hand on his forehead when he said, I'm from the people of Ghifar. Well known people. Ghifar robbed. Hatta some of the narrations mentioned. They were the only tribes that never used to observe Ashur al hurum the sacred months. They didn't care about that. They would take and rob whatever they wanted. 
فقال فقلت في نفسي ابي درس اي سيت تو ماي سيلف كره اني هي ديسلايك ذا اي انتميتو الى غفار ان اي اتريبيوتد ماي سيلف تو ذا بيبل اوف غفار هي هيتد ات ثم قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ذا ذا مسج سيد ومتى كنت ها هنا How long have you been here? He said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ha huna mundu thalathina. I was here for 30, bayna laylatin wa yawmin. 30 days and 30 nights I've been here. The Prophet then said, فَمَنْ كَانَ يُطْعِمُكَ Who was providing for you? Who was gay? Where did you get food from? To eat. He said, مَا كَانَ لِي طَعَامٌ إِلَّا مَا أَوْ زَمْزَمٍ مَا أَوْ زَمْزَمًا I had nothing except zamzam water. Fasamintu, I became chubby from it, Ya Rasulullah. I gained weight from drinking zamzam water until you, I have these flabs. Then the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Innaha mubaraka. The zamzam water is a blessed water. Innaha ta'amu tu'min. It's food. The zamzam water is food. Fakala Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr then he said, Ya Rasulullah, eat the li fi ta'amihi layla. Abi Dhar said, Ya Rasulullah, can you give me permission to give him food tonight? I'll serve him for 30 days and 30 nights for someone not to have anything to eat. Can I take care of him? Can he be my guest? The Prophet said, yes, take him. Fafa'ala. So the man went, Abi Dhar radiallahu anhu, he went with Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. The first meal he had in 30 days and 30 nights was... Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr, the food he gave him, was it? what was it, brothers? Huh? He was having zamzam already. So what did Abu Bakr gave him? Abu Bakr just gave him raisins. The Sahabas, brothers and sisters, they, they didn't live that expensive life. And some of the narration mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ has said to Abu Bakr, you take him, I have nothing to give to him. That's the life that the Messenger والسلام, and his companions were in. Today, brothers and sisters, we have options after options. صح? Yeah, brothers. We have so much we can choose from. And we're like, I don't like that. Can I choose something else? Well, no. You'll be asked about the blessing that you've been given. One day you'll be asked, يوم القيامة, all of these blessings that we have and all of these things that we have, we're going to be questioned about it Yom Al-Qiyamah. قال أبو ذر he said فكان ذلك أول طعام أكلت بها This was the first food I ate, the raisins that he gave me. فلبثت ما لبثت I remained for as long as I remained ثم أتيت رسول الله I came to the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم He said فقال إني قد وجهت إلى أرض ذات نخل. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said, I have been directed towards a land that has many trees, referring to Medina. The Prophet said, meaning I'm going to be moving to and I'm going to be going to a land that has many trees, meaning referring to Medina. He's telling this to Abi Dhar al Ghifari. وَلَا أَحْسِبُهَا إِلَّا يَثْرِمَا The Prophet said, I don't believe any other city is this except Medina. فَهَلْ أَنْتَ مُبَلِّغٌ عَنِّي قَوْمَكَ Are you now going to go to your people, Abi Dhar? Now that you've embraced Islam and you've taken the religion of Islam, and you've taken your shahada, are you now going to go to your people and convey the message of Islam to them? لَعَلَّ اللَّهَ أَنْ يَنْفَعَهُمْ بِكَ وَيَأْجُرَكَ فِيهِمْ Allah might reward you and you get reward for it. Abu Dhar and he said, I will, O Messenger of Allah. The Prophet then said, listen, Abu Dhar. Now that you've taken Islam, don't come back to me again until you hear that I've become strong and I have something. In other words, the Messenger, look, he prophesied that he's going to, and he's not going to remain like this. He knew it, alayhi salatu wasalam, because Allah told him and that Islam is going to spread. He also told him that he's going to move to Medina. And the people of Ifar are close to Medina. 
So Abi Dhar went back to his people. He spoke to his people. He said to them, listen, I'm telling you, I've seen this man, spoken to him. He's a prophet from Allah. Half of the people of Nifar, half of the tribe, they embraced Islam. The other half, they said, if he goes to Medina, we will embrace Islam. And when the, when the Prophet came to Medina, the second half of the people of Ghifar embraced what? Islam. Abi Dhar, he brought Islam to his people. That's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Ghifar, meaning the people of Abi Dhar, Ghafar Allahu Laha, may Allah forgive them. Are we all together, brothers? Which shows in the story that one person changed the whole tribe. Are we all together, brothers? One person whose life and his biography, قبل Islam, and before he embraced Islam, was not the best of biographies. Sah? Abi Dar radiallahu anhu. He had a very, very bad life before Islam. But when he came into Islam, he became Sahabi al Jalil, the noble companion. Lidalika, two things we always need to remember taking Islam gets rid of everything that we did in the past, any sins that we've done. If it's human right, of course you have to give back people's rights. Islam cannot uplift that from you. The second thing is repentance. It's anyone who repents, it's like he has never committed that sin. Are we all together, brothers? Now what I want to go through, inshallah ta'ala, is the methods that Quraysh took to fight the Prophet ﷺ. We're going to go through those methods and we're going to look at today. Have they changed or those methods are still the same? Number one, the first method Quraysh took to stop the Prophet's da'wah was إِثَارَةُ shubuhat حَوْلَ مَصْدَرِ الْقُرْآنِ الْكَرِيمِ They wanted to open doubt on the source of the Qur'an. Where is the Qur'an coming from? And what is its source? They wanted to open doubts on that. إِثَارُ الشُّبُهَاتِ Are we all together? Opening what? Doubts. حَوْلَ مَصْدَرِ الْقُرْآنِ On the source of the Qur'an. So what they were saying was, this Qur'an is taken from an, a human being. إِنَّمَا يُعَلِّمُهُ بَشَرْ He is taught this Qur'an by a human being. All this Allah is teaching him and all that. That's not true. إِنَّمَا يُعَلِّمُهُ بَشَرْ A human being is teaching him this. They also were saying, وَقَالُوا أَسَاطِيرُ الْأَوَّلِينَ اكْتَتَبَهَا فَهِيَ تُمْلَى عَلَيْهِ بُكْرَةً وَأَصِيلًا this has been dictated to the Prophet ﷺ in the morning, in the evening, in the afternoon. Someone's dictating things to him and he's writing it from them. This is nothing that he's come. In another place, in the if This is not Allah giving it to him. Are we all together, brothers? So this issue of saying the Quran is not from Allah and that it's from a human being was one of the doubts that was already mentioned. They also were saying, مَا لِهَذَا الرَّسُولِ يَأْكُلُ الطَّعَامَ وَيَمْشِي فِي الْأَسْوَاقِ Why is this prophet walking in the market like us? He eats like us. What, what special things does he have that we don't have? And one of the people that gave the messenger sallallahu a harm Oh, let me mention the second point and I'll mention who it was. From the claims that they used to mention was, or this, one of the ways that they used to push the Prophet away was, they used to say, which is different to the first. They would say, has Muhammad told you that verse? Guess what? We will tell you something similar. We will tell you what? something similar. So let him tell you guys a verse and guess what? We will tell you a story of the, the, those who came before. We're going to tell you some of their stories. And let's see, see. 
And one of the people that used to do that is Al-Nadr ibn Harith. Al-Nadr ibn Harith, whenever the Messenger sallallahu mentioned something to the companions and the people, Nadr ibn Harith would say, has he finished? Yeah, let me now tell you that. Sir. And he would do that to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Walidhalika in the Battle of Badr, after the Battle of Badr, he was killed in that battle by Ali ibn Abi Talib. Are we all together, brothers? And some scholars, they say his sister, Qutayla, his sister, Qutayla, and some people, they say she wasn't his sister, she was his daughter. She wrote some few lines of poetry to the Prophet ﷺ when her father or her brother, whichever one it was, when he was killed. She wrote a few lines of poetry. Let me read those lines of poetry for you. And these were lines of poetry that made the Messenger ﷺ cry. When those lines of poetry reached him, he cried. And he said, if I was to see these lines of poetry, I would have not يعني, allow him to be killed. Some of the scholars, they say the Prophet himself killed another Ibn al-Harith. Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. She said the following line of poetry. She said, Ya rakiban inna luthayna madhinnatun min subhi khamisatin wa anta muwafaqu ablig biha maytan bi anna tahiyyatan ma in tazalu ma in tazalu biha najaib takhfiqu minni ilayka wa abaratan masfuhatan جادت بواكفها وأخرى تخمق هل يسمع أن النظر إن ناديته أم كيف يسمع ميت لا ينطق أم محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم أم محمد يا خير ضن كريمة في قومها والفحل فحل معرق ما كان ضرك لو من أنت وربما من الفتى وهو المغيض المحنق أو أو كنت قابل فدية فلينفق بأعز ما يغلو به ما ينفق فالنظر أقرب من أسرت قرابة وحقه من كان عتق يعتق ظلت سيوف بني أبيه تنوشه لله أرحام هناك تشقق صبرا يقاد إلى المنية متعبا رصف المقيد وهو عاد موثق When the Prophet heard those lines of poetry Ibn Hisham and he said إن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لما بلغه هذا الشعر When the Prophet these lines of poetry reached him he cried till the tears filled his bed. And he said, If this was to reach me before, I would have made sure that he was not killed. So it shows you two things. The mercy of the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. Number two, there's a battlefield. They, Quraysh, attacked the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. On top of that, the Prophet, he cried. Number two, the power of poetry and the effect that it can have on people. Sah? Are we all together, brothers? So another Ibn Harith was one of those individuals. Another method that was taken, another method that was taken to cause doubts about the Quran or the religion or the Prophet Sallallahu to stop him which they took was as-sukhriyyatu wal istihza mockery to mock and to belittle and ridicule and is that a method that's taken today to mock and ridicule that's a method that they still take they said to the Prophet وسلم, by mocking him وَقَالُوا يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِي نُزِّلَ عَلَيْهِ الذِّكْرُ إِنَّكَ لَمَجْنُونَ They said, you're crazy to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. They also said to him, وَعَجِبُوا أَنْ جَاءَهُمْ مُنْذِرٌ مِّنْهُمْ وَقَالَ الْكَافِرُونَ هَذَا سَاحِرٌ كَذَّابٌ They also said, بَلْ قَالُوا أَضْغَاثُ أَحْلَامٍ بَلْ افْتَرَاهُ بَلْ هُوَ شَاعِرٌ They said, he's a poet. He's making all of this up. That's what they said to him. They even went as far as to say, وَقَالُوا قُلُوبُنَا فِي أَكِنَّةٍ مِّمَّا تَدْعُونَا إِلَيْهِ وَفِي آذَانِنَا وَقَرْ Our ears are closed and our hearts have locks on it. They say this to the Prophet ﷺ, وَمِن بَيْنِنَا وَبَيْنِكَ حِجَابٍ 
And between us and you, Muhammad, there is a cover. فَعَمَّلْ إِنَّنَا عَامِلُونَ Do as you wish, we're going to do what we wish. So they were mocking and they were belittling the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. And this is something, brothers and sisters, that you see from the non-Muslims even till today. Belittling the Prophet, ridiculing him, ridiculing the religion of Islam, bringing up some of the ahadith that are authentic and mentioning the Qutb al-Hadith, like the issue of the virgins for the martyrs. You, say, you see them mock these things. How can a Muslim should feel sorry for the one who's mocking? It should not in any way, shape or form feel you, make you feel different. Are we all together, brothers? Now, you all will have to remember the Prophet والسلام, he said that this matter, يعني, Islam, will reach where day and night reaches. It's going to go everywhere. There's nothing or anyone who's going to be able to, who's going to be able to stop. Also, the method that they took to يعني, stop the Prophet والسلام, or stop his message was they tried to say to the Prophet why don't you move forward from what you're upon and you, we come forward and we meet in a middle path you come from your religion Muhammad and you come to, from our religion we come to a little middle path and we meet there this is a good place for all of us what they're coming from is batil and the more that they come towards Islam, the more better for them it is. Like in when you leave the haqq and you come to falsehood, there's no khair in that. Are we all together? It was a tactic and a move that they wanted to take to convince the Prophet Sallallahu to compromise. To compromise on his fundamental beliefs. That's what they were trying to do. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala told the Prophet Sallallahu Allah said to the Prophet, if we were to not make you strong, if we were to not make you firm and solid, you were close to, maybe going towards them a little bit. And if you did that, we will make you suffer in this world, Muhammad. And we will also make you suffer in the hereafter if you compromise even a little bit in your religion. So, that was another tactic that they took and they did to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasalam, he didn't do and he didn't compromise. And what he said to them was, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ لَا أَعْبُدُ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ وَلَا أَنَا عَابِدُ مَا عَابَدْتُمْ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا عَابَدْتُمْ لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ الْيَدْرِ Simple issue is, you have a religion, be upon what you are, I'll be upon what I am. They came to the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam and they said, Ya Muhammad, please listen. If you want women, if you even want power and leadership, guess what? We will, we promise you that we will give you leadership. You can control. And we will not make any move without your stay. We'll take you, we'll take you as our leader. Okay? And we will marry you off to the woman, the best woman of Mecca. And every money will bring it to you. We'll make you the richest from amongst us. Okay? We we'll give you leadership. All of that. The Prophet والسلام, he said to the man who was bringing all those offers, he said, did you finish what you wanted to say? Huh? He said, yes, I did finish. The Prophet والسلام, he said, Isma idan minni. Okay, listen to what I have to say. And all the Prophet did was recite verses on him. And the Prophet went and walked away. All he did is recite the Quran for him and he left. And we all together, brothers. You have the truth in your hand. It's not like them. They don't have the truth in their hand. So they can compromise, they can change, they can alter. Because the scholars, they say, 
There is no sin after disbelief. Once you reach disbelief, there's no sin you can do worse than that. صح? لكن لازم مسلم. Oh. So the Prophet refused alayhi salatu wasalam to even compromise. And that was a method to weaken the process of the Prophet's da'wah alayhi salatu wasalam. They wanted to weaken it. Punch a little hole in it and it leaks a little bit. And so this, the Prophet saw it with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he did not compromise and he stuck to his path and he kept calling and kept calling and from that session, from that gathering, when the Messenger alayhi salatu refused all of that, the, 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 the weight of Quraysh came heavy on the Messenger alayhi salatu, even more than before. Because now they felt they put themselves out there for the Prophet. They offered him things. They were willing to compromise and he refused their, their offers. So they came even more harder on him. And that's where the Prophet وسلم, had to leave uh, Mecca. Now we're going to go into the Prophet وسلم, how he was the adab Quraysh put to the Muslims. The Messenger وسلم, as I mentioned, he kept calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Quraysh, they gave up. They gave up. They did everything to the Prophet والسلام, And now they reached that level there. We, we try to show him something, beautify something to him, doesn't want it. We scared him, doesn't want it. What should we do? So then they said, the only thing we really need to do is we need to harm him even more. He has to be scared of us. We have to terrorize him. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Abu Talib is still alive and he's a thorn in their neck as well he's not allowing them to move even a little bit towards the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam so this is causing them uh, stress so what they did to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was they set certain groups of people to take on harming the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. These were the people, these 16 individuals were the ones who was harming the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam every little opportunity they could get. They couldn't do much because of Abu Talib, but they would do whatever they can. The first one was Abu Lahab. He had the biggest. Abu Lahab died in the battle of Badr as a kafir. After the battle of Badr as a kafir. He didn't go to the battle. He said, I'm not going to go to the battle. He was scared. Abu Lahab. The second one was uh, Sufyan ibn al-Harith. Sufyan ibn al-Harith. Sufyan ibn al-Harith is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is what? Ibn Ammihi. And he cousins him and the Prophet alayhi wa sallam. The next person was Utbah ibn al-Rabi'ah. The fifth, fourth one is Shaybah ibn Rabi'ah. Five was Uqbat ibn Abi Mu'ayyid. The next one is Abu Sufyan ibn Harbin. The seventh one is Al-Hakam ibn Abi Al-As ibn Umayyah. The ones who embraced Islam were um, Sufyan ibn Harith. He embraced Islam. He became a Muslim. Utman ibn Rabi'a and Shaybat ibn Rabi'a, both of them, they died in the Battle of Badr. They are non-Muslims. Sufyan ibn al-Harith also took Islam. The conquest of Mecca, he took Islam and he was, Islam was very good. Al-Hakam ibn Abi al-As ibn Umayyah also embraced Islam on the conquest of Mecca. Another ibn al-Harith, which I spoke about, he was uh, taken as a captive in the Battle of Badr. And the Prophet commanded him to be killed. Some of, the, some of them, they say he killed him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abel Bakhtari, Ibn al-As ibn Hisham, also used to harm the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He died in the Battle of Badr as a disbeliever. Abu Jahl, who also died in the Battle of Badr. And he's called Fir'aun Hadi al-Ummah. Abu Jahl's nickname is Fir'aun Hadi al-Ummah. He was killed in the Battle of Badr. لعنه الله الوليد بن المغيرة الوليد بن المغيرة له he died in 
the battle of Badr as a non-Muslim. The father of who? Khalid ibn Walid. Al-As ibn Wa'il. Al-As ibn Wa'il, he died in the battle of Badr as a disbeliever. Ubay ibn Khalaf, he also died in the battle of Badr as a disbeliever. He was killed by a slave he used to own. Who is it? Bilal killed him in the battle of Badr. Ubay ibn Khalaf was also a disbeliever who died in the battle of Uhud as a disbeliever. Some of the scholars, they say, the Prophet never killed al nadr ibn al-Harith. The only person the Prophet ever killed in his hand, alayhi salatu wasalam, was Ubay ibn Khalaf. There's an agreement on that, that the Prophet did, alayhi salatu wasalam. Al-Aswad ibn, uh, ibn al-Muttalib ibn al-Asadna was also from the people who harmed the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, and he died in the Battle of Badr. And last but not least, Al-Aswad ibn Abdi Yaghuth. He was alive, he died in the Battle of Badr as well. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he, so these 16 people were harming the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at every opportunity, every corner, every turn that they could possibly get, they were harming the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they were the heads of Quraysh, they were figureheads. So their harm was not just, it wasn't just any, phys, any other harm. Let's look at some of the torture that the Sahabas went through. And Imam Ahmad, he narrated in his Musnad, and Ibn Majah narrated in his Sunan with an authentic chain of narration that Abdullah ibn Mas'udi radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, كَانَ أَوَّلَ مَنْ أَظْهَرَ إِسْلَامَهُ سَبْعَةً There were seven people who first embraced Islam. Seven people. The narration mentions, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa Abu Bakr wa Ammar ibn Yasir and his mother, who knows his mother? Sumayya, yeah. She was the first what? Martyr in Islam. Islam, our first martyr was a woman. The first person who embraced Islam was who? Was a woman. And this idea, brothers and sisters, that there's a competition being between men and women, it's, it's silly, to be honest. It's actually what? It's just silly, to be honest. That we always have to prove that a woman took Islam first. And in Islam, there is, a, if a woman prays and worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and if a man worships Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, both of them, inda Allahi sawa. And we all together, brothers. In our religion, we believe ummahatul mu'mineen are better than all of us here, sah? Is there anyone going to question Khadija? Are you better than Khadija? Any one of you here? Yeah? Is anyone here better than Aisha radiallahu anha and Umm Salam and all of them? Hello, Allah. Far greater than us, sah? And we're happy that the wives of the Prophet are with him in Jannah. Actually, one of this, when I was young, one of the questions that came to me was the people that were the highest in Jannah are the prophets, sah? This was a question I had when I was young. That the people who are the highest in Jannah are the prophets. There's no one, is there anyone higher than the prophets in Jannah? But then the evidences show us that the wives of the Prophet are going to be with the prophet in Jannah, Muhammad and they'll be like Muhammad's higher than all the other prophets. And then his wives are going to be higher than the other prophets. Do you guys understand? This was a question I had when I was young. I asked my sheikh, who's also my uncle. Sheikh Ahmed Tahir I asked him when I was young. I never forget, I was in the car and he was in the front seat. Uh, he was in the front seat and the driver was driving, I was in the back. I said, uncle. By the way, my uncle graduated from Jamia Islamia as a PhD from Jamia Islamia. And he used to teach uh, uh, Sheikh uh, Abdul Muhsin Abad's children, Abdul Razak and Abdul Muhsin's brothers. And even uh, Sheikh Abdul Haq. He mentioned that Sheikh Rabi'a's kids he used to teach as well. Hello, Kulli Hal. So he has a lot of qisas, stories of Sheikh Albani, because he used to go to Sheikh Albani in Sham and used to sit with him. And they used to, there's a majalla that used to come out, it's called Al Isala. There, there was a newspaper that used to come out. Sheikh Albani used to write on that. Sheikh Ahmad Tahir always used to write on that. And the students of Sheikh Albani used to. I remember I even went to Sheikh Abdul Rizak ibn Abdul Muhsin one time. And I said, Sheikh, can you write me an ijazah? 
And he said, I don't know you. Rightly so, he doesn't know me. But I knew a card I can use right now. So I said, Sheikh Ahmed Tahir West is my uncle. He said, he looked at me, I remember. He looked at me, Sheikh Ahmed Tahir is your uncle? He said, yeah, Sheikh Abdul Zahir. He said, if you can prove to me, get a letter from Sheikh, Abdul, Abdul, Sheikh Ahmed, I'll write you any tazkiyah. If he writes you a tazkiyah, I'll write you a tazkiyah. Sometimes it's good to use your family members. <laughs> but in Islam, that doesn't exist. Everyone's actions is what puts them forward. صح? There's a Somali saying, my dad has a camel. What's better to say is I have a donkey. صح? Say my dad has a camel. What's better to say I have a donkey. صح? So I asked Sheikh Ahmed Tahir, I said, Uncle, can you answer this question for me? And the Sheikh, mashallah, he's, a, he's like a, he nurtures you. What does he do? He nurtures you, he teaches you. So he f saw from me too much questions. Every time I have a question, it comes up to me. So I remember he told me off. He said, be quiet. Shh. Don't say a word. I was in the back seat. I'm quiet. Because what he saw from me was asking questions, ask questions, and he saw that could lead from me asking things that could bring doubt to my heart. Yeah, are you with me, brothers? I, I, uncle said so, and he's also the sheikh. So I didn't, I went quiet and I never asked again. I went through Majmu' al Fatawa Ibn Taymiyyah. As I was reading, Ibn Taymiyyah was asked this question. In my Majmu' al Fatawa, I wrote the story of Sheikh Ahmad Tahir and me on the side, on the benefit on the side. That this same question, as a kid, I asked my uncle Sheikh Ahmed the same question, and it's fascinating that Ibn Taymiyyah was asked the same question. And the reason I want to do is when I go and get this book, and I meet Sheikh Ahmed Tahir, I the Sheikh, he remember me. I, here, Ibn Taymi was asked a question, okay, Shir. I wasn't the only person who asked. Are we all together, brothers? So is that a very good question? That the wives of the Prophet, alayhi salatu are what? The wives of the Prophet, are with Nabi Lai Muhammad, so by default, they're going to be what? Yeah? They're going to be, by default, they're going to be higher than the what? The Prophet. Yeah, who has the answer to that question? Who's thought of that question before? Who, the, who did that thought come to? First of all, what's the evidence that the wives of the Prophet are going to be with the Prophet in Jannah? Are yeah? How much are you? So that's the evidence. Good, so we know that wives, they follow their husbands. So if a wife is married to a righteous husband, okay, and then guess what? She, she, he dies, for example. If she gets married, who's she gonna be in Jannah with? So when Shahab Haq mentioned, she chooses from the two husbands, which one she wants to be with. And there's another view that says she's going to be with what? The last husband that she was with. Huh? Good. There's two views, mashallah. Ibn Hazmi mentions the third view that's very off. Like these are the two most common views. Uh, yeah. So how do you can reconcile between the, the, the wives of the Prophet are higher than the prophets? Does anyone have an answer? Okay, homework. Majmu' al-Fatawa, look for it, it's there, inshaAllah ta'ala, bi'ni lahi al kareem Okay, we'll take some questions, inshaAllah ta'ala, and we'll conclude there, inshaAllah ta'ala. We'll mention the surah min al-ta'adib wal ida some of the harms that sahabas were inflicted with. Next lesson, inshaAllah ta'ala. Faddal. So what she was trying to say in her poetry when she said, Ya Rakiban in Al Uthaina Madhinatun fi Subhi Khamisatin wa anta muwafaku. She was trying to plead to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. 
And she was calling him out by saying, you're an honorable man, a Muhammadun. You, Muhammad, are min dil'i karimatin. You're from a very well-respected people. You're a very kind individual. You could have forgiven. When you had that moment of power, you could have just got, let go and said, I forgive it. I forgive him. And you're known to do that. Or if you didn't want to take that option and you wanted to be a bit harsh to him, then you could have asked for some money, blood money. We would have given you whatever you asked for. Now here I have no father. The Prophet felt her pain with what she was talking about. And that's why he cried, alayhi salatu, alayhi salatu salam. Okay, I didn't know that, mashallah. Okay, mashallah. Allahumma. <laughs> Ibn Hajar made dua so he can be like an Imam al Dhahabi. Ibn Hajar made dua so he can be like an Imam al Dhahabi. Oh, yeah? Tabbar. I can't hear you. My hearing is not that good. To the Prophet ﷺ. If I honestly if now I can't remember any other opinion. Do you have you come across something else? I I, I don't know. I can I only re read quickly when I was preparing the Sira class. He was the first to say to the Prophet ﷺ, "Assalamu alaikum ya Rasulullah." Sahih. And Ali ibn Abi Talib took him. He slept in the masjid and Ali ibn Abi Talib saw him and Ali took him to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. And Imam al-Bukhari mentioned a different wording like that. Now, So it could be reconciled between it being different days when he went to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Wa alaykum salam. Which, which? The riwayah of Ali Imam Muslim, he, he doesn't mention he read verses to him. Did, did I mention verses? No. But the riwayah of Sahih Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala, Imam al Bukhari, I don't remember as well that he recited verses to him. Huh? Yeah, yeah. The, what was the verse that he read to the Prophet Ali Sallallahu I tried to remember while I was telling you the story. Does anyone know the verses that the Prophet recited to him Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Ah. For for sure. What what the ayat? Ha. For in arado, فقد أرسلتكم صاعقة مثل صاعقة عاد وثمود. يعني that's what's true. He read those verses from Jazak Allah Khair and Barak Allah Fiq. He read those verses on him. And he reminding him of the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of the previous nations and how Allah is going to deal with them and the way Allah dealt with them when they disobeyed their prophets and the messages that were sent to them. That's what the Prophet recited alayhi salatu wasalam. And this is another message, an important point in Islam to reflect on the previous nations, how Allah dealt with them. And it's important reading the umam al-madiyya, the previous uh, Nations, the way Allah dealt with them, very important for our way forward. Because the qa'idah to the scholars is a tarikh yu'idu nafsa. History repeats itself. Okay? And Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, they say, Allah's universal signs, it doesn't change. صح? That's why the Prophet, when it, when it became a bit foggy, and it became a bit cloudy, and it was a bit dark in the sky, yeah? what did the Prophet do? It was a bit dark and foggy and it was about to rain. And the Prophet they said he became very nervous. He was entering the house and coming out. And so the Sahabas, they said, Rasulullah, it's rain. But then he was contemplating 
on what happened to the previous nations. وَذْكُرْ أَخَا عَادٍ إِذْ أَنْذَرَ قَوْمَهُ بِالْأَحْقَافِ وَقَدْ خَلَتِ النُّذُرُ مِنْ بَيْنِ يَدِهُ مِنْ خَفْشِ مَنْ لَا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا اللَّهِ Allah mentions after that, in that same Surah Al-Ahqaf. وَلَمَّا رَعَوْا عَارِضًا مُسْتَقَبِلَ أُوْدِيَتِهِمْ قَالُوا هَذَا عَارُطٌ مُمْطِرُنَا بَلْ هُوَ مَسْتَعْجَلْتُمْ بِهِ رِيحٌ فِيهَا عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ تُدَمِّرُ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ مَا مِنَ رَبِّهَا فَأَصْبَحُوا لَا يُرَى إِلَّا مَسَاكِنُهُ صح؟ يعني they were destroyed by rain and they didn't know it was rain they thought it was going to bring them good right? so this is important as well that you look at how Allah Taala was with the previous nations and that's why these classes that Sheikh Muhammad Tibbet is going to be doing Hafidhahullah on this tafsir is important brothers the Quran is the closest way to understand Allah's actions and the way he does things there is no better way to know Allah than his own words subhanahu wa ta'ala we all together and there is no other way better to know the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam except from his seerah or his sunnah are you with me brothers so by learning the tafsir of the Quran you learn Allah tabarakahu wa ta'ala as what I know he's, I'm going to mention a side benefit, I'm going to mention a side benefit, as I, I, it's funny, but it's worth mentioning, it's funny, but it's worth mentioning. Just the other day I was reading, he's called Khatib al-Mu'tazila, Chahir. He's called what? Khatib al-Mu'tazila, he's the Khatib of the, the Mu'tazili group. He has a kitab called Al-Haywan and Al-Bakil and stuff like that. He saw a woman come out one day. And Al-Jahid, with him being a Mu'tazili, but he's been bona fide and I mean, when it comes to Arabic language, he's on another level. His works in Arabic language is on another level. So they said he saw a woman who didn't, uh, he didn't appear to look good. She wasn't appearing to look good. So what he said was, وَإِذَا الْوَحُوشُ فُشِرَتْ He said what? Yani he's trying to say when the creatures all come out, and they all gather together. He's trying to say that about her. So she knew the Quran very well. And as she came closer to him, she said, وَضَرَبَ لَنَا مَثَلًا وَنَسِيَ خَلْقَ وَضَرَبَ لَنَا مَثَلًا He's giving a parable to us, but he's actually forgotten what? Both of which are verses from the Quran. We're all together, brothers. Both of which are what? From the Quran. The point and the moral of the story is, brothers and sisters, the, imp the relationship that we need to have with the Qur'an is that it impacts our life. Everything we do, we see it through the verse, the Qur'an, we see it through the hadiths, we see it through everything, right? Now, Tadal Shaheed. Yeah, poetry that are written before Islam, the pre-Islamic poetry, brothers and sisters, Wallahi is very beneficial. Are we all together? For example, in Islam, is there a difference between sleeping a gnome and a sinner? Sleeping gnome and a sinner. The ulama, it's a mas'ala fiqhiyah, right? They look at it, well, the call of the Arab poet. This is an Arabic language, is there any difference? And you know the poetry of Imrul Qais, Alimma ala al-rab'i al-qadimi bi as'asa ka'anni unadi aw ukallimu akhrasa falaw anna ahla al-dari fiha ka'ahdina wajadtu maqeelan indahum wa mu'arrisa fala tunkiruni innani ana dhaakumu layaliya halla al-hayyu gawlan fa'al-asa Inna he mentions, Imrul Qais is very long, in there he mentions, he says, فَإِمَّا تَرَانِي لَا أُغَمِّضُ سَاعَةً مِنَ اللَّيْلِ إِلَّا أَنْ أَكُبَّ فَأَنْ عَسَى He's mentioning, you will not see me close my eyes and sleep, or even go through, إِلَّا أَنْ أَكُبَّ فَأَنْ عَسَى Which is sinna, ma ma na'as. Oh, I don't even go through. A temporary close of the eyes. فُقَهَا Ibn Ghudam in his Kitab al-Mughni, Nawawi in his Majmu' Ibn Abu Muhammad Ibn Hazmin in his Muhalla, they mention a shahid from the pre-Islamic poets, right? I read it in a book. I don't know who it was. Who was it? He said, 30 years I was given fatwa from Kitab Usibawih. Fatwa. I had the, Sheikh, do you know the, who is it? 
30 years, I was reading Al-Kitab. You know Al-Kitab by Siba Wai. The book is a grammar book. It's not a fiqh book. It's a grammar book. He said for 30 years, or I think it was 30 or so, he said, I was giving fatwa from this book. Meaning I was using Arabic literature and Arabic grammar. I was using that to understand the Quran and the Sunnah. صح? So I honestly, honestly, I, I encourage students of knowledge who want to be very good in the deen, Arabic. One of the things, when I was very young, my father always, always used to say to me, and the older I get, the more I realize, you know what? Wallahi well, can't. It's, it's, it's so true. Which is the Arabic language. My father would say to me, if anybody knows the Arabic language more than you, by default they're going to learn the religion faster than you, even if you what? You were in there for longer than them. It's a key that just opens doors for you. Are you there, brothers? So try to familiarize yourself with the Arabic language. I've always emphasized on this. You become, mashallah, able to get to the sources and the benefits. Are you there? But once it happens that you have this obstacle in front of you from the Arabic language, and I've said this to you guys before, right? That the Arabic language is the language of every Muslim. That is your first language. The second language is the language of your country. The minute you embraced Islam and you became a member of this religion, you need to know the Arabic language is your language. It's not the language of the Arabs. Arabic language is the language of every Muslim now. Are we all together, brothers? So the first thing we need to do is we need to go towards that direction of what? Learning the Arabic language. I just want to mention a, a small benefit. Me and Shahid today were sharing about the Arabic grammar and the Arabic language. Some of the people, they go towards learning Arabic, صح? especially they start with Arabic grammar when they learn. They go for Ajrumiya, Mutarnimatul Ajrumiya, and Qatrun Nada, wa Ballu Sada, and Lamiyatul Af'al, and Shad al Arf, Tay al Hamlawi, and Al Fiat Munu Malik, and Mughni al Labib, Limni Hisham al Ansari. People go through those books. But recently I saw something, people try, trying to study Ajrumi and then we said we finished it. But in reality, they have suffering in three fundamental things. If you do not have brothers, this is benefit inshallah ta'ala for the students who are learning Arabic grammar. If you're learning Arabic grammar, if you can't answer three things, you can't be talking about detailed matters of grammar. And remember this, in Arabic grammar, there's only two things Arabic grammar ever talks about. Nahu is only about two things, bes, nothing else. Are we all together? Ahkamul kalima and ahkamul kalam. That's it. Al ahkam, ahkamul kalima and ahkamu al kalam. So if a person masters ahkamul kalima, they can go to Ahkamul Kalam. What does Ahkamul Kalam mean? It means the rulings related to the word, a word. And Ahkamul Kalam means the rulings related to what? Sentences. Some people are talking about sentences. When in reality, they don't know Ahkamul Kalam, a kalima. And Ahkamul Kalam, there are three things you need to be able to answer in order to move into Ahkamul Kalam. Ahkamul Kalam. What are the three things that you need to know? For Ahkamul Kalima is three things. Number one is Anwa'ul Kalima. How many types of Kalima are there? Isim Fi'lun? Okay. Why do the Arabs put Isim before Fi'l and Harf? Why? Why don't they say Fi'l Isim Harf? Why don't they say Harf Isim Fi'l? You have to know. You have to know this reason. Why? Why? Why does the Isim come first and then a Fi'l comes? Every grammar book. Ijma, there's no difference of opinion. All of them. Ibn Malik says, Kalamuna lafdun mufidun kastaqib wasmun wa fi'lun thumma harfun il kalim wahiduhu kalimatun wal qawlu am wa kilmatun biha kalamu kadyu am. Ibn Malik mentions isim fi'l harf. Ajroom, what does he say? What did Ibn Ajroom say? Al kala, what's the beginning? Yeah? 
نوت نوت الجرميه ذا مثل مثل الكلام هو اللفظ المركب المفيد بالوضع واقسامه ثلاثه اسم وفعل وحرف وحرف جاء لمعنى فهي منجز اسم فعل حرف there's a reason why ابن look at all the shuruhat of Alfiyat ibn Malik one of the biggest mistakes you see shuruhat ibn Malik like ibn Hisham and ibn Aqil and لو حواشي on Alfiyat ibn Malik when they mention al-kalam they say kalam ala lafzul mufidun kastaqim wasmun wa fi'lun thumma they say thumma is like wow like ismun wa fi'lun wa harfun ibn Malik there's a reason why he said thumma harfun al-kalim he didn't just say it for that reason. Daqiq, he specifically chose Thumma. He's trying to show you that the harf is far at the end. And these two are closer to each other. Are we all together, brothers? <laughs> Ibn Hisham, who Ibn Khaldun said in his Muqaddimah, there has come to us, the news, huh? the news of a man has come to us, Ibn Khaldun is saying in his Muqaddimah, whose grammar is more even greater than Sibawahi. He was talking about Ibn Hisham, Al-Ansari. Ibn Hisham is a big grammarian. He has a kitab called Mughni al-Labib. Mughni al-Labib. An Kutub al-A'arib. You know what that book is for? It's the last book in grammar. They said to him, why do you not do I'rab of the Quran? The Quran, why do you sit down and do grammatical analysis on all? He said, I've written a book. Anybody who reads it can do the analysis of the Quran themselves. They can do analysis of any word that's ever brought to them. The whole kitab is called Mughni, suffices, al the wise person. al kutub al arib it suffices them from any books of what? Grammar, grammar rulings. One thick volume now, Darul Ubaid published it. You can buy it now before the book fair finishes on the 13th. Two more days, the book fair is going to finish. These book or co publication companies, they should pay me some money, right? Some commission, <laughs> the way I promote their works. But really, this kitab, you have to buy it. So brothers, let's go back to the point. The first thing that the person needs to know from a kalima is anwa'u al-kalima, ism, fi'l, and harf. Ism, you need to know three things from an ism. Ta'rifuhu, alamatuhu, taqsim, aqsamuhu. The same thing, three things you need to know from a fi'l. تعريفه وص تعريفه بالفعل هو ما دل على معنى في نفسها واقترنت بأحد الأزمنة الثلاثة. You need to know that. You need to know علامته أو أقسامه. It's types. Once you know أنواع الكلمة, you move on to the next, which is تقسيمه. ال تقسيم الاسم تقسيم الاسم إلى نكرة ومعرفة. أما انقسام الاسم إلى نكرة ومعرفة you have to know this six types of معرفة صح the معرفة how many types six types ضمائر علم اسم إشارة اسم موصول المضاف المعرف بالألف أما المعرف بالأل على مذهب سيبويه and the sixth one is what مضاف ب المضاف بالمعرف those are the six معرف صح تعريفات. Other than that, all of it is نكرة. And last but not least is انقسام الكلمة إلى نكرة إلى معرب ومبني. وإز معرب وإز مبني. All of these brothers and sisters, if you master, والله brothers, إن الله تعالى I'm going to try to make a video on this. If you master those three, later when you come to جملة اسمية جملة فعلية and وما يتبع ذلك, you enjoy it. And brothers and sisters, the Quran that we have today is in this language. Wallahi, billahi, I swear by Allah. Qasaman liman ahalla al-qasam, I swear by the Lord, who permitted for us to swear by his name. I will say this to you all, that wallahi, anyone who learns the Arabic language, he will enjoy the Quran. The miracle that we have in front of us. جاء النبيون بالآيات فانصرمت وجئتنا بحكيم غير منصرم آياته كلما طال المدى جدد يبينهن جمال العفق والقدم The miracle that all the prophets came with he left but our miracle is the Quran it, to, in, Ramadan is going to come for you to enjoy this book the gems and the jewels inside this book it's amazing and the way that you can 
it's possible is if you invest your life and your time to what? Learn the Arabic language. Master this language so much that you are able to understand the Quran from so many different ways. You will enjoy it. Ibn Jarir al Tabari he said, Inni la atajabu. Ibn Jarir says, I am fascinated. القرآن, the one who recites the Quran, بها, and he doesn't enjoy it. How do you read this Quran and you don't even understand what it's saying to you? And you're not even enjoying it, the meaning that is, that is in it. Ah, brothers. So, wallah, you're prevented. Honestly, I believe you are losing out if you don't have this Quran, uh, the meaning and the understanding of it. You're losing out in this world. And that is a hirman. Are we all together, brothers? So now that these tafsir classes are taking place, there's no excuse. There is not. There's no excuse. I was young. My father used to have books. I used to see tafsir al Jareed, tafsir al Kathir, Qurtubi, all of this. I'm thinking to myself, Dad, why is there not one tafsir book? One of the common questions that you ask right when you're young isn't one tafsir not enough? You read tafsir al Jareed Tabari on an issue and you're like, Allahu Akbar. Then you come to Ibn Kathir and you're like, whoa, I didn't think that come out of the verse. Then you go to Muharrar al-Wajiz by Ibn Atiyah. And then you go to Abu Hayyan al andalus Allah. Then you go to Al-Alusi, Abu Thana al-Alusi, Rahimahullah. There's something. Muhammad al-Amir al-Shanqiti, you're going to be like, what can he possibly add? He's recent. So what can he say that they haven't said? Oh, Allah. Everybody is saying something extra why because the quran's power and miracle doesn't change and it will still be written and we all together i remember sheikh uh, our sheikh sheikh abdi kareem uh, al khudair in uh, saudi arabia he was teaching the kitab al bayan fi al quran bil quran and he said something at the beginning it's recorded you can listen to it on on, on youtube or from his he said about the book because he's teaching a like a recent scholar, Muhammad Amin al-Shaqir, right? Are we all together about this? A recent scholar. He said, وَكَمْ تَرَكَ الْأَوَّلُ لِلْآخِرِ How much has those who come early? Uh, actually, no, Muhammad Amin al-Shaqir says that. At the beginning of his kitab, like just because he's doing the tafsir book, he's trying to say to you, remember, those who came before us have left so much for us to still talk about. The door's not closed. So... The Quran is a miracle, haqiqatan. So brothers and sisters, go towards the Arabic language, study it. Alhamdulillah, with technology now, you can be studying from the comfort of your home. Zoom, you can go in and you can benefit, you can study. Sheikh Tim actually has a, a basic level of the Arabic language where you can study Alif, Ba, Ha, Ba, Jeem. From that level, he's going to take a person to a level of how he's speaking it, inshallah ta'ala. So please, for yourself, you're going to thank me later, inshallah ta'ala. If you become a scholar, just like mention me with dua or something, inshallah ta'ala. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdi ashadu la ilaha illallah.